Good morning, everyone. And um, I am truly honored to be here today to see all of you guys. It really is actually very moving. And also for Cornelia, who was so inspirational to our generation and our gender, our meaning women. I loved her, we all loved her, and she was always at these events, and we would be running madly behind her, trying to keep up with her and to go to the next event. She was a dynamo of energy and heart, and if you are watching this, Cornelia, which I'm sure you are, I love you, and this one is for you. So let's see. Oh, that works, okay. So the title of the talk today is uh, Get Climate Ready New York, and let's start with the risks. So we'll start with Sea level rise, but that's Kate's bailiwick. Extreme heat waves have already been experienced. Uh, in terms of heat, Rhode Island is the first state whose average temperature rise has eclipsed two degrees Celsius above average temperature. And along with the cities of Los Angeles and New York, to the right is the heat map of New York City. So the urban heat island effect is the most dangerous and deadly of all the climate effects, far more lethal than all the storms and tornado events put together in any given year. And given the irregularity of climate change, along with too much water in too short a time, agriculture in this re region will be highly affected, but is particularly acute for the Northeast, where heavy rainfall events have increased more in, than any other region of the country. So consequences for food security will have profound effect here in New York in the future. And we need to start planning how to support ourselves now as access to food will become a challenge by 2050, as countries stop trading food so they can feed their own people. That's actually starting now. We know about massive floods. And uh, yeah, this one is a touchy subject. The service infrastructure in the Northeast is at increasing risk of disruption, leading to cascading failures during extreme weather and climate-related disruptions. So most of New York's skeletal infrastructure dates from the first part of the 20th century. The subways are an average of 90 years old, sewer mains 84 years, water mains 69 years, and they are all essential to life in New York City. But the city doesn't really have the money to fix them. So over a 1,000 miles of New York City water mains are more than 100 years old, leading to frequent and disruptive breaks. And New York has a combined uh, water and sewage system, which is a real problem now, and especially for the future. And during rainfall, excess flow is diverted to a combined sewer overflow and discharged untreated into the city's waterways, leading to an estimated 27 billion gallons of raw sewage and polluted stormwater every year. And this can have serious health effects, and green infrastructure actually could solve this quite, quite a bit. So the failing of an outdated subway system isn't only inconvenient, it's dangerous. There are leaking ceilings and water-damaged walls, uh, paints peeling from the, city, from the ceilings, the columns are rusting. New York subway stations are terrible, says Passwell of the University Transfer Transportation Research Center. They're dirty, they're dingy, they need painting, they need new architecture, they need better lighting. But these issues go beyond cosmetics or more inconveniences. Leaking roofs, damaged station equipment, particularly electro, in short, the city can't pay for the upgrading of the subways. So over 50% of all streets in New York are substandard and they need fixing. But this is not done fast enough to keep up with the wear and tear of the streets. So the degeneration of New York streets is increasing every year. But the good news is that New York infrastructure badly needs to be totally rebuilt. It's just too old. So this gives us a chance to really update the city for the next century and climate change. New York City, the clock is ticking. As climate change intensifies, perhaps no place, this is what this article says, in the United States is more vulnerable than New York City. Because of its unique geographic location, New York faces at least five major threats from climate change, which you've heard about already. So the first, I'm a solutions person, so these are solutions. This is how we can save New York, okay? So the first big idea is that the urban landscape is a necessity and not a commodity, and we have to actually get this out to all the other people who are here in New York City. 
Urban dwellers are particularly vulnerable, part because many of these infrastructure systems are reliant on each other. As climate change impacts increase, climate-related events will have large consequences for significant numbers of people living in cities, like us. So, however, changing conditions also create opportunities for the future. And this is our job, to teach people how important the urban landscape will be in the near future. So, the public realm landscape is, when you think about it, the largest piece of urban infrastructure a city has that can be re-envisioned, re-engineered, reshaped, redesigned, and regenerated. And to make a city climate ready, what typically is underplayed is soil, and how important the earth itself, its soil, how it plays such an important role in addressing climate change. So according to the IPCC 2018 Climate Change and Land Management, they say it can help reduce, and in many cases, even reverse adverse impacts of climate change. The report shows how managing land resources sustainably can help address climate change and this will also be true within cities. Land use planning is going to be essential in order to prepare cities for climate change. Depending on how precious land will be allocated, citizens can have the basic needs for urban life which will be generated and supported by nature. Food security, while countries can take coordinated action to address climate change by improving and protecting the land, will improve, for, it will improve food security, water security, reduce heat, support biodiversity, and within cities, the land can provide all of these in addition and can mitigate stormwater management, reduce air pollution, you know the whole list of what it can do. So, also, there is no infrastructure within the city that is as large and contiguous, which is very important for nature-based solutions which can offer the environmental benefits at a scale that will matter. As a profession, we must all work together to educate actors within the built environment and about the necessity of the urban landscape and its value. It can no longer be viewed as a commodity used just for decoration, although I'm a decoration person, definitely. That's the best I can do, actually. It will be the platform for our lives. It is therefore a necessity. So, the big idea next, number two, what are the benefits of rearranging the city? Let's rearrange the city. First of all, we need less dependency on centralized infrastructure. So as infrastructure crumbles or fails, which is what's happening right now, we will need to be less dependent on centralized systems. Most cities are in the same position as New York, where cities' infrastructures are so old, but nobody can afford to actually put them back together again because of the size and the growth. Even New York can't afford it. And so we need to build, but we have to build for more flexible, smaller scaled systems that can be replaced and are more flexible and can be regenerated. This is how nature-based systems could be of a tremendous help to cities' infrastructural problems, but it needs space. Almost all streets in the entire city need to be redone. This is also a huge expense and project. However, it is an excellent opportunity for New York to replace their impermeable paving like Munich has done with permeable paving. Open up the, uh, the urban soil to soak up rainwater and plant linear forests along the streets in lieu of street trees to deal with the tremendous stormwater management issue. Due to the breakdown of infrastructure and the unknown vicissitudes of climate change, we must be more dependent on, guess who, each other. The concept of community has been awakening as a renewed way of looking at our cities and at ourselves. It's simple, we will need each other in the future. This is not going to be a cakewalk. Cities must establish neighborhoods to work together to address localized issues. This will be needed for quicker reaction to unexpected problems that may come up due to climate change. Things will get worked out much more quickly and efficiently in a smaller group. Working with other people and groups is actually how we evolved. We need to depend on each other to help address serious issues that face us all. However, running a mega city makes these conversations and actions impossible. We need a more fleet and accessible foundation, such as neighborhoods, to address difficulties in the future. At an individual, neighborhood, borough, and city scale, we must work to generate food and renewable energy. We need a backup plan in the future. I'm not from Montana, by the way. I'm from Philadelphia, so just saying, or Wyoming. So 
To become more self-sufficient when the lights go out, communications are down, supply chains are broken, and you're hungry, make sure your necessities are with you. The more you're off the grid, the more secure you will be. I know, it sounds crazy, right? Okay. So it's important now, actually, to recognize the importance of land and natural ecosystem services, which provide cities the ability to address the most difficult and dangerous of all climate risks for cities. So my next big idea is respatializing New York City. Let's go to the 20 or the 15 minute neighborhood, which is a growing idea in cities around the world like Barcelona and Paris. This is an idea that New York once considered, but now it should be reconsidered. Replacing infrastructure to update the 19th century is just a bad idea. We need to think deeper and broader. New York needs to rebuild for another climate. And not only that, a climate that will continue to change. Whatever we do to regenerate New York, it must be flexible and resilient. And given the impact the climate has on the cities and these inhabitants, cities are starting to take stock in what is really important in life. Carlos Morenos was just awarded the 2021 Obel uh, Award. Uh, actually, I'm the chair of that jury. It's an architectural jury, and, but we were all unanimous. Um, he's an associate professor at the University of Paris and advocates for a truly livable and sustainable urban future that places each global citizen at the heart of the city. His model has actually started being implemented in cities such as Paris, Chengdu, Melbourne, and Barcelona. So we're at a very interesting time where the 18th to 20th century cities structure and planning are breaking down. As well, we have to design our cities as if we're going to be living on another planet. I call it spaceship Earth. As technology is racing along, it turns out that our future means of transport will allow this mega change in city structures, and this is happening now. New York actually doesn't have a choice anyway. We're not going to be able to rebuild our subways. Why? Because climate change is making New York's underground transport unfeasible and dangerous as water will eventually flood the entire system as sea level is rising. That's happening now. It's an inevitable fact. So New York's transport will hopefully be built above ground. That's my wish. Extremely important is that the reorganization of our transport will enable us to acquire the land we will need to insert working ecological systems into our cities. So the most important benefit of future transport will be the creation of more space within the city. So the basic idea of the 15-minute city is that our typical way of planning and designing cities to the left is to prioritize cars at the bottom and walking at the top is the lowest priority. But to the right, the 15-minute city is just the opposite, where pedestrians take the priority and vehicles are the lowest priority, so to enhance the quality of life. Research shows that a 15 to 20-minute walk is the maximum time people are willing to walk to meet their daily needs locally. And based on human needs and scale, the 15-minute city is fundamentally a pathway for the, re the reorganization of a large mega city. And these cities have grown past their capacity to rejuvenate. They can't be repaired. The decentralization of cities by creating smaller mixed-use neighborhoods will be able to better manage their immediate environment and take on more control and interaction within their surroundings, which will keep the neighborhood working, which ultimately makes the whole city more resilient, more reflexible, and stronger. And planning for flexibility will be a new way of planning and building our cities to be able to adapt to a changing climate. So I view the 15-minute city much like building redundancy in a submarine that are built for safety, where if you get a leak in one compartment, it doesn't flow into the others, and therefore the submarine is safe from sinking. Um, as we know, the Titanic was not designed like that, hence it sank. Viva la différence, huh? right. So the 15-minute city is built of complete neighborhoods where residents can find most of what they need locally, generate more responsive local growth, vibrant neighborhoods, stronger communities, more viable local businesses and commerce, lower emissions, and more active travel. Each district has the features it needs to support a full life. The 15-minute phrase actually has roots in Portland, Oregon, where the 15-minute neighborhood has been used as a planning concept since 2010. 
Since the Portland's plan's adoption in 2012, the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability has begun implementing 142 actions and are building on the success of the plan for the next 25 years. So why don't we get on it? Uh, Polly Trottenberg, the New York City's Transportation Commissioner, said she was aware of Barcelona's Superblocks plan and would consider applying the concept to New York. We're certainly formalizing, quote, things that are close to that concept, she said. And quote, there are a lot of different models and there's not a one size fits all, which is very true. So the 15 minute neighborhood is growing, a growing idea in cities around the world. And this is an idea that New York has considered, but now it should be reconsidered. Replacing infrastructure to update the 19th century, as I said, is a horrible idea. And we need to think about our future more uh, in depth and more broadly. New York needs to be rebuilt for another climate. Not only that, a climate that will continue to change, as I said. And what do we do for New York? Whatever we do, it, we must be able to continue living here in this wonderful city. So there's already a compelling evidence that the 15-minute city can work. And what's more, there's a market for building neighborhoods that don't require cars. A research report found that so-called walkable urban places in the United States demand 75% higher rent over the metro average in the nation's 30 largest cities. I see the 15-minute city as a concept and a wake-up call. No matter the merits, the debate over what a modern city is or designed for climate change should look like, how it should function, and whom it should serve, the topic of urban respatialization has grown increasingly clamorous around the world. We can't continue in a business as usual fashion. We need to try new ideas and ways of organizing New York. It's time to do it. We can't go forward with outdated infrastructure in our usual way of thinking and the annoying habit, human habit of not liking change because the climate is changing faster than expected. If we do not respond in a radical way to radical times, New York will suffer immensely. I suggest we get creative, come up with ideas, and start to test and implement them like now. It will be a multi-generational, extremely expensive task. However, it will be a lot less expensive and painful if we go forward unsteadily than sit around, business as usual, doing nothing to protect the city from climate change. We need big scale ideas to address climate change. So big idea number four, nature-based solutions. Great idea, right? Ecological urbanism, which embodies a wide range of nature-based solutions, is a concept where solutions that are copied from nature to form a comprehensive agenda while looking at the city holistically. If applied to New York City, these ideas, interventions, and policies would have a vast potential for energy and resource efficiency with co-benefits for the city's economy, its environment, its infrastructure, its health of its citizen, citizenry, sorry, and society in general. So nature-based solutions can specifically address two central problems, which absolutely have to be anticipated, which of course is the urban heat island effect and more storms, more floods. So these solutions employed for an urban landscape such as New York, is a very, it's, which is a very denatured city, will make it more climate ready, more resilient, more self-sufficient, sustainable, and healthier. However, unbuilding the road system has to be done anyway. It's all screwed up, it's awful. Removing the old and broken impervious surface, which is a big reason why the city floods, should be replaced with permeable surfaces as well as opening up the land so water can percolate and also cool the temperatures. Repaving the city would cost way less than continuous repairs and the cost of health care. So the integration of nature-based solutions to a hyperdense city like New York will present challenges that may require the introduction of the concept of unbuilding the city. This would involve strategic erasures within the city to open up more land for environmental benefit and adaptation. Given that the majority of streets in New York need to be redone, it provides a real opportunity to dig them up and repurpose them to fit future transport, along with enough space to build linear forests within the cities. Forestation is about a scalar plantation of forests within the right-of-way of streets, 
which would be at a scale that would affect the temperature of the city and can make a huge difference in the way the city's ability to manage stormwater. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit. So nature-based solutions actually must be part of a mainstream land management strategy and policy which provides solutions for restoring ecosystem services and will be key to rebuilding our cities. So they can really, we can prepare for climate change. So next I'd like to show you how afforestation, when applied to cities, could make large scale contributions to fighting off heat island effect and mitigating carbon dioxide and many other things it can do. So I'm introducing entrepreneur Shubendu Sharma, whose company is called A Forest. Does anybody know about him, A Forest, Shubendu? Oh, you would, right? Okay, so um, <laughs> creates a handmade indigenous dense forest on any patch of land. He says A Forest is on a mission to bring back our native forests by creating them and works passionately to create natural, wild, maintenance-free native forests on and off-site to provide the best solutions at the lowest possible cost. He's a real businessman. In an area, an area the size of six parking lots, he can plant 300 trees, which can come to life for a cost of an iPhone. So the Milwaukee method is based on restoring native forests from seeds of native trees on very degraded soils. It's a unique methodology proven to world, work worldwide, irrespective of soil and climate conditions. And more than 3,000 forests have been successfully created worldwide using this methodology. So the Milwaukee forest grows into two or three years and are self-sustaining. And they can be built to pol into polluted industrialized areas and they fit any shape. And they can be any shape or any size. So I'm presently collaborating with Shubendu on a research grant, almost done, from the Harvard Climate Solutions Grant to study how to plant linear forests within our city streets. And I believe that urban afforestation is going to be one of the most important solutions to our cities, especially to New York, which will get much hotter and wetter. It's an idea that the city should be considering now. And I would be, it would be an amazing initiative for New York City to afforest the city through building real green infrastructure. I would hire Shubendu as a city forester immediately. So the next one is about lin the linear urban forest. So let's imagine how New York could be in a forest, walking in the street within the shade of a linear forest that runs throughout the city, replacing lonely and bedraggled street trees. This year, I was lucky enough to receive the Harvard Climate Change uh, Solution Grant to study this idea of planting linear forests. So our test site is Springfield, Massachusetts. It's about 33 square miles with a population of about 150,000. And we chose the site because it's a hot spot in Massachusetts, a city not too big, not too small. Uh, the city has been extremely happy about this because they too have a rotting sewage problem and they can't afford to redo it. So the linear urban forest is an idea of how we can cool the cities in the face of global warming. We are hoping to instigate a paradigm shift as transportation revolutionizes in this century, releasing road space. The team has 21 people. Specializations include afforestation, ecological biodiversity, forestry research, human health and welfare, civil engineering, smart surfaces, future transport, calculations of environmental benefits, and I'm the good idea person. So this grant was built upon a studio that I did at Harvard in 2017. I'll go through it really quickly. So the, it was called Sequestropolis, a machine for glo uh, combating global warming. Yeah, so we worked in conjunction with the Harvard Forest, which is the oldest studied forest in the United States. And the research had covered all of the state. However, no research had been done within the cities. And I could go on and on about how cities are ignored in the IPCC and the climate discourse. That, that bugs me a lot. So we chose the most happy and viable of all the, uh, of the four scenarios of Harvard Forest, which was forest as infrastructure. So our site consisted of uh, four townships, Cambridge, Somerville, Brookline, and Boston, 108 square miles with about 900,000 people, about a million people. And the studio goals had to be uh, very coherent because everybody was forced to create metrics on this. So our goals were to manage stormwater management, to provide irrigation during drought, reduce the use of energy, increase albedo, that's a very important piece of design, create ventilation corridors, create habitat, and enhance quality of life. 
So the reason for the linearity is that we are taking over space within the right of way of the street. So imagine a lane of trees rather than cars running throughout the city. Continuity will be created by a continuous underground bed of native soils in order to grow a true forest where the roots and soil biota thrive to support the forest. So, I mean, real forests support so many more environmental benefits than street trees. So that's the idea, is maximal environmental benefits for cities. The class would assume we would build the forest using the Miyawaki method with Shubendu Sharma, who was actually working with us. And the big problem that we faced was to build forests in an existing old city that was very dense. Where are we going to get the space? Well, it turns out it would be the, um, the roads. So the study was set in 2050. And the students learned about climate change and what the effects are going to be by 2050. And it's very much like New York. So we all worked together as a team. We measured all the streets in these areas. And everybody had to design all the streets. So um, we had to create these assumptions. First of all, we were going to actually put in stormwater management devices to retain and detain within the linear forest trench. Um, we used only permeable surfaces. We painted every roof we could white in Boston. I mean, you know, it was a studio, so we didn't really go out there and paint. But okay, so but we chose trees from uh, Zone Seven. We were taught how to use eye tree, which was a miracle. Now we had to, you know, shave it down to only a few metrics, but we took uh, carbon dioxide sequestration, stormwater take up, air pollution removed, energy usage used every year, and avoided emissions. Here are the AVs, and uh, a, a really great, of oh, the AVs, sorry, and then this great um, drawing, which basically turns out that we could harvest 25 to 40% of the area of streets which is great, so we harvested space out of the street. So I'm gonna just show you one project from one of the students. Uh, this is from A.J. Seuss, and he had Brookline. So here you could see, I mean, he was uh, looking at the various streets. In order to do this, we had to kind of figure out the typologies, and everybody had to design the typology. So, I mean, this is Brookline, Massachusetts. Um, this is the street he was dealing with. It was, had a, a, a train line in it. And uh, this is the beginning of him designing where the linear forest is going. But the most important drawings were the, 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 um, uh, the sections, because we had to determine what was actually going to, how were you going to design under the ground? That was really absolutely, you know, number one. And then the designing of the street to be able to uh, have parking and stop-offs for uh, AVs. And this was in a, um, a residential district. So there's a huge long list of benefits of urban afforestation that Charles won't let me read, but I can assure you it's a very good idea to do this. And in terms of the metrics, and this is why I really went for the grant, is that AJ, with his one uh, site, what saved $74.5 million in energy savings for Brookline, but when we put all the students together, there were 11 students, it came out to $207 million of energy savings. Not to mention that it, there was zero water that was put into the stormwater sewer, not to mention the biodiversity, not to mention cooling down the city. You know, I mean, it was like, wow. And Harvard Forest was like, wow, I didn't know what you guys did. Seriously, he's like, can I have some of those drawings? I said, remember, we partnered in this. So anyway, I have a nonprofit called May Day Earth. Uh, that's what I'm doing. I'm advocating for uh, the support of climate intervention and also for nature-based solutions, specifically stratospheric aerosol intervention, which is the only thing we have on the table to cool down the earth. But I won't go into that, OK? I promise. All right. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.